Our next speaker, Brother Danny Douglas, is a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ since 1977 and has served churches in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. He's done full-time foreign work. I always say foreign. I think of what a fellow said one time. He said, uh, you know, there's nothing foreign to God, so why don't we call it foreign work? He did work overseas <laughs> in the Ukraine and the United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years. That's about as much people can stand. Where he served as teacher, principal, <laughs> and college instructor. And now he's involved in business. He preached over the radio for over 20 years and is a teacher with True Bible Institute. He's currently preaching in various churches of Christ in Middle Tennessee and is involved in mission work in the Lord's Church in the Philippines. He's blessed with a good wife and doing the Lord's work for Arnie Habalon. Douglas, and their two precious children, Lydia and Daniel Moses, and they are. I know he misses them about now. Come and speak to us on this important subject of the power within by Jesse W. Farnsworth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Brown. It's always a privilege and honor to be here with the Spring Church of Christ and the faithful brethren involved in the Contending for the Faith lectureship here. And I'm thankful for this faithful congregation of the Lord's people. Also, I'm very thankful for the faithful eldership here at Spring and the very sound and faithful preacher and Brother David Brown, a good friend and faithful soldier of the cross. And I also want to thank uh, Brother and Sister Brown for being brave enough to have me in their home this week and thank the last two or three years. Uh, thankful for their gracious hospitality and the fine hospitality of the congregation here of the Good Sisters in Christ and the gracious food that we've had this week. I feel like I'll be a bigger preacher in the Brotherhood <laughs> after this week. Uh, somebody said the other day after I got here uh, about a brother who said, are you staying out of trouble? He said, no, I'm sound. And that's about the way it is these days. And uh, but we're thankful to be able to stand up for the gospel of Christ. As Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. So we're thankful to so many brethren here for this opportunity and privilege and most of all to our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. The book under review at this time is entitled The Power Within by the late Brother Jesse E. Fonville, published in 2005. And uh, this book really has in it the issue, Does the Holy Spirit Lead Man Apart from the Word of God? And the author of this book openly affirms that the Holy Spirit does operate directly upon the saint for his sanctification and salvation apart from, in addition to, the Word of God. He also affirms in this chapter that the Spirit is involved with the alien sinner directly in some way apart from the gospel the Word of God. Brother Pavel states that the focus of the book is, quote, on the role of the Holy Spirit in the developmental life of the child of God, leading to his or her salvation, and the Spirit's work in the church beginning in Acts 2. He states as his twofold aim in the book, number one, to give reasons why we believe that the Holy Spirit works both through his word and through external means in the work of saving man. And number two, that the Holy Spirit as deity cannot be limited or confined within a covenant except as he has agreed to be bound or limited in particular areas within that covenant. The author of Labors uh, seems absorbed with the idea that the covenant of God might in some way bind the Spirit's working but when we understand the purpose of the New Testament, 
and the fact that everything in it pertains to man's spiritual benefit and salvation, obviously his idea is shown to be illogical. The all-wise God would never be confusing to man's understanding of the work of the Lord. And over in John the 16th chapter, Jesus promised the apostles that when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth in verse 13. And then down in verse 14, he shall receive, he shall glorify me, that is the spirit shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now when we consider the things of the Lord, in view of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3, that all spiritual blessings and heavenly places are in Christ. And then, of course, going with that down in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. If the Spirit would receive of that which is Christ and would show it to the apostles, who in turn would communicate that to man through the inspired word, then what would there be for man to know or to have that is not revealed in the all truth that the Spirit would guide them in and which has now been given to man. If it was Brother Fonville's purpose to reveal something that cannot be known because the new covenant does not reveal it, then how did he know it? If it's his purpose, it was his purpose to suggest that which the scriptures do not suggest by his own implication, then why or where did he get the authority to suggest it? Well, now we want to look at his view of the Bible. And as we look at this, it gives us an insight into these individuals who feel that God must do something outside of the word of God, the gospel for man's sanctification and salvation, that something extra needs to be added. And by looking at his view and looking at this book, it will help us to understand more where these individuals are coming from. We know that one's view of the Bible has a direct bearing on his view on whether or not the Spirit operates directly on man to guide him. And those who hold to the direct operation of the Spirit on man in sanctification and salvation feel that somehow the Bible falls short, that something extra is needed. He states, quote, however, there are some operations from which we can safely infer that he, that is, the Spirit is greater than his sword, the Word, and that he cannot be limited in his function to just a giver of information, end of quote. This seems to me to be a very strange and confusing statement. Having to say or feeling the, the need to say that the Spirit is greater than his sword or his word. Imagine what would be the need for me to get up and preach tonight that Jesus Christ is greater than his blood. That would be confusing. What would be the purpose of that? The blood of Christ is a part of Christ. It is inseparable from him, just as the church is inseparable from Christ. In like manner, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, is, insepar is inseparable from the Holy Spirit. These such statements are confusing indeed. We know that the book fails in conveying the true nature of the word of God. And in this, it fails in its mission to show what he's trying to show. He says, but it is important to remember that God has a higher standard by which he exists. Absolutes of justice, righteousness, truth, and love, which are a part of his attributes and which he can never violate. But the rules he made for us were not made for deity, and they are not required to follow them. 
He will strictly follow, of course, his agreement and his part in the covenant that he makes with his children. Now, if God has somehow lowered the standard for man, as this statement implies, then let me ask this question. How, by following the Bible, the Word of God, can we become like God? How can we become partakers of the divine nature according to 2 Peter 1 and verse number 4? How can we do as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? In Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 43, when he teaches us to be like our Heavenly Father, Jesus said there, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? The next verse tells us that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And in the last verse, 48, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. We know that one of the grand purposes of the divine revelation of God's word is for us to become like God. If God did manifest himself in the form of a man, and he did, because God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, 16, in Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, Matthew 1, 23, and if to see him on earth was to see, see Jesus on earth was to see the Father, in heaven, and it was, John 14, 9, then how could not God have manifested the principles of God to man the highest principles? To fail to do that would have been to deny the deity of Christ and his likeness of the heavenly Father. Now how is the likeness of Christ conveyed to us and thus the likeness of the Father. It is through the inspired word of God. The apostle John wrote, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full, 1 John 3 Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. The things which John and these apostles wrote enabled men to have fellowship with God the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, which indicates that the written word could not in any way fall short to convey the high standard of God to man or lower it in any fashion. For example, the highest possible love is seen in the example of Jesus Christ. And we are told to imitate that love. We see that highest form of love in the Son and in the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And then in Philippians 2, we are, it is enjoined upon us to imitate that love love that mind of obedience, sacrifice, servitude, humility, submission to God, and willingness to suffer. Now, if God's word has been lowered in any fashion to convey the highest principles of God, then how could we develop the mind of Christ within us? And how could we imitate that love? But Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We are told to follow and to imitate God. 
Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. In Romans 5 and verse 8, But God commended this love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ was seen the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews 1 and verse 3. In the word, Jesus Christ was manifested the Father's glory, according to John 1 and verse 14. But yet, if the Bible in any way has been lowered and not revealed to man the high principles of God, then these matters would be impossible. It would be impossible for us to know Christ and to see the Father through him if these things have not been conveyed to us. Now, Jesse Fonville argues, in subsequent chapters we shall deal with the word and how it is all sufficient, yet as it performs its perfect work, the word itself specifies other necessary forces which contribute to the salvation and sanctification of man. Also, we will look at some of the various helps that are given to Christians after the close of the first century and the completion of the word, that is, after the cessation of miracles performed by people and after the direct operation of the Holy Spirit in completing the inspired word, 2 Peter 1, verse 21. End of quote. That's on page 13 of the book. But the problem with such teaching and these individuals who take this viewpoint is that they feel the need for God to do something extra. They do not truly believe in the all-sufficiency of the scriptures. Evidently, they do not fully embrace what Paul declared to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, truly furnished unto all good works. In accord with that, James said that the word is able to save your souls, James 1, verse 21. Now, is the word able to do that? And then consider Paul's statement to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 and verse 32, conveying the all-sufficiency of the word to strengthen man and finally to lead him to heaven. When he said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Friends, today what is needed is not writing of this kind. That's not what the church needs. The church doesn't need to be told that you need something in addition to the inspired word of God. That's not what the church needs to hear. But here's what the church needs. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. What the church needs today is the word of God. We need to be told the word of God is able to save your souls just as the Bible teaches. In Romans 1, 16, Paul declared, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, indeed, the word of God is a revelation of the mind of God according to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 to 16. Brother Franklin Count makes this statement in his book, the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. He says the work of the Holy Spirit is to take the mind of God and make it known to man. This proposition is set forth in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 16, 
1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, and 2 Peter 1, verse 21. This we now have in the written word. Now, if that's not the case, then it would be impossible to obey the command in Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because we all know and fully appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ was and is fully divine. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, from Isaiah, Paul quotes, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The point of Paul in this passage is that man could not, by nature or natural senses, come to know the things that the Lord has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto man and can know them because of the revelation. Verse number 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. On down in the passage in verse 13, Paul said that we speak with the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual now, Brother Fomble and these other brethren who feel that something extra is needed, that God needs to lead us and guide us in some way in addition to the Word, evidently do not understand the true nature of the Bible and the Scriptures. The fact that the Word of God itself is a manifestation of the character of of God. As we look at 2 Timothy 3 16, the expression, inspiration of God, that is from the Greek word theonistos, meaning God breathed. Brother Fineville further argues the Bible tells us that there are several things that we can do to the Spirit that we cannot do to the Word. We can vex His Spirit, Isaiah 63 10. Apparently, we can lose the Spirit, Psalm 51, 11. We can resist the Spirit, Acts 7, 51. We can quench the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. We can despise the Spirit, Hebrews 10, 29. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, and we can blaspheme Him, Ephesians 4, 30, Matthew 12, verse 31. Now, of course, these things can be done to and against the Holy Spirit. But we, can we name any one of these things that can be done to or against the Holy Spirit that are not done in connection with the rejection of and disobedience to the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit? Not a single one. Every one of these things are done to the Spirit in connection with resisting his word, rebelling against it, and disobedience to it. Another fallacious argument is the one that he makes in reference to the power mentioned by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Although he mistakenly references Ephesians 4. But he said, what is that power? And he's speaking of Ephesians 3, 20, where Paul said, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He asked, What is that power? That power is not promised to the people of the world, and they do have the Bible. Obviously, it is a power that is provided in addition to the Bible. Well, again, this is a weightless argument. Where has the Bible ever said, or where has anyone in the church ever taught that simply possessing a copy of the Bible would give anyone salvation, sanctification, or the power indicated by Paul here in this passage? We know in order to have sanctification and salvation and the power that God works in and through the Christian, we must be obedient to the word of God. 
In 1 Peter 1, verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then in James 1, 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. One could have a fatal yet curable disease and live next door to a hospital and die with that disease, having never gone next door to receive treatment and to have medicine and treatment applied. In like manner, one can possess a hundred copies of the Bible, but unless and until he obeys the word of God, it will not save him. Later in the book, he says regarding Ephesians 3, what is the power that works within us? Is it something in addition to the word? It would seem so. Notice verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. Paul did not say strengthened by his word in the inner man, but rather by his spirit. End of quote. But think about how many things that the Bible says the spirit does. And yet the word does these things. Yes, the spirit does strengthen man. But the word of God does that. It is able to build you up. Acts 20 verse 32. The spirit leads. Romans 8 14. But does the word of God not lead? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. One is born again of water and the Spirit. John 3, verse 5. But we note that the word of God begets being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, verse 23. And so what the Spirit does he does it through his word, the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. The author furthermore argues that God somehow works on the heart of the alien sinner to lead him or her to Christ. He said on page 63, how often in what ways does the Holy Spirit help in bringing the willing heart to the Lord? Lydia, Acts 16, 14, is another example of an honest seeker receiving some assistance from the Lord, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. He quotes the end of the verse in Acts 16, 14. Here he assumes that this was a direct operation of the Spirit upon the heart of an alien sinner in Lydia. Here, Brother Fonville opens up a whole new realm of religious error in teaching that the Spirit works upon the heart of the alien sinner in conversion. Now, what's the implication of this? The implication is that the Great Commission in taking the gospel to the world is insufficient. For Jesus said to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What does the whole world need according to Jesus? The gospel of Christ. And then he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. What is the implication here? That what Paul declared in Romans 1, 16 was not completely true when he said the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Because Brother Fonville says there needs to be some other operation regarding the heart of the alien sinner. But yet the entire verse here in Acts 16 verse 14 says this. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worship God heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Indeed, the verse says that the Lord opened her heart. But notice what preceded that statement. In the interlinear Greek-English New Testament, it says that as she was hearing, 
that really conveys the sense there that as she was hearing, the Lord opened her heart. This, friends, is how the Lord opens people's heart. And the only way, it's through hearing the word of God. In Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As we come to a con conclusion this evening, uh, for the last little while here, to have the scriptural view of the Spirit's work, one must have the scriptural view of the book that he inspired, the Bible. We cannot have the proper view of the work of the Holy Spirit and have an incorrect view of the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. In the first place, the Bible is not a dead letter. It's not dead. It is living. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We might illustrate it by the seed planted in the ground. We can plant the tiny seed in the ground and up comes a tree with branches and much fruit. The scientist can observe that seed. He can examine it, observe the development of it in the laboratory but he cannot explain the life and the power in that one little seed. Man cannot explain it, except to say that God put the power and the life in that seed. Spiritually speaking, the seed is the word of God, Luke 8, verse 11. The word of God is the incorruptible seed, according to 1 Peter 1, verse 23. And the power in the life, in the seed, God's word, cannot be explained except to say this. God put the power in the word. And there is power in the word of God. Soul saving power. The word of God strengthens against temptations. The example of Jesus proved this. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 4, when he answered Satan's solicitations to do evil three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. You know, one of those times he said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Again, this shows the true nature of the word of God, that it proceeds from the very mouth of God that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost according to 2 Peter 1 verse 21 there is power in the word of God you know I've noticed something this week at the lectureship and I want to commend this and that's the several young people that we have here and in fact sitting up near the front that's a good thing I want to commend them for being here and their attention and their reverence and sitting near the front. And what I'm going to say here not only applies to young people but to all of us, but the word of God will help us to overcome temptation and sin. The psalmist in the long ago said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse 11. One time a young man had grown up and he was about to leave home and his mother wrote these words in the front of his Bible. She wrote, only this book will keep you from sin and only sin will keep you from this book. If we want to overcome sin in the world, we need this vivifying, powerful, life-giving, living word, the word of God. That's what we need. We need to be filled not with all these books that men, men have written to lead people away from a respect for the all-sufficient inspired scriptures. We need to be closer to God and to his holy word. We need what Paul said in Colossians 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You know, Jeremiah said that the word of God was like a fire in his bones. He could not stay. He couldn't hold it in. He couldn't contain it. In Jeremiah 20, verse 9, maybe we've heard about the older preacher who told his preacher students, he said, boys, don't preach if you can help it. You know, he was right. If you can keep from preaching, if you can hold it in, you shouldn't be a preacher. You know, those early disciples, they couldn't hold it in. Even under persecution, we read that they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, verse 4, not their opinions. Paul said, we, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. What did that mean? He meant that we preach the word of Christ. That's what we preach. We don't preach books of men and opinions. We preach the word of Christ. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 tells us. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 21. And the eyes of the world is preaching not foolishness, but it's the, it's the wisdom of God. Jeremiah said, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Jeremiah 23, 29. The word of God is like a rock to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. What is the only thing that will tear down the bastions of Satan, false doctrine, false religious systems, sin in our own lives, sin in the church? It's the word of God. The word of God is like a fire. Fire sterilizes, doesn't it? Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15 and verse 3. You know what a lot of congregations need today? They need a good purging by the word of God. What do a lot of people need today in their lives? They need a sterilization, so to speak. Cleansing by the word. We need the word of God. That's what will clean the church up. That's what will get us right with God. It is like a hammer the word of God is on the heart of sin and the ramparts of Satan. It is like a fire though. Fire spreads. God wants his word to spread. As the word of God grew and multiplied in Acts 12 verse 24. But fire also comforts that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15 and verse 4. Uh, like other brethren here, I preach many funerals. And you know, when people are distraught and torn to pieces, when you get up and open this book, there comes a comfort over those that respect this holy volume. There comes a comfort that cannot be explained by man and a peace. Fire comforts, brings warmth against the cold. It will also thaw out cold brethren and stir the lukewarm into action and build a fire unto them as it were like the lukewarm lay out of sins in Revelation chapter 3. The word of God is powerful. God had only one begotten son and he was a preacher. He was a preacher. Brethren, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He stands behind the sacred desk, a book held in his hand. And as he speaks, his brethren know he is a Bible man. Upon the scriptures, right and truth, he ever takes his stand. 
To make the gospel clear and plain, he is a Bible man. He loves the grand old book divine. He loves to preach the plan. He loves the lost. His message saves. He is the Bible man. Let skeptics doubt and heathen rage and build their hopes on sand. He loves and lives and teaches God's book. He is the Bible man. When worlds shall end and stars shall fall and at the throne we stand, how sweet to hear the king's command. Come home, you Bible man. You know, all Christians tonight are Bible people. You don't have to be a preacher. But you know, tonight, we in the Lord's church that are trying to stand for the truth, we need some encouragement. We need to be reminded that one day the Lord's going to welcome us home if we've been Bible people. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And he that doeth the will of God abideth forever, John said. Tonight, as we conclude, this is the answer right here. The Spirit works, indeed he does, but he works through that which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, his sword, the Word of God. Now, there was a man who was an uneducated man in this world's eyes, but yet he knew a profound truth, and that is, after Jesus spoke a very hard and difficult saying, the Lord turned to the twelve after many went back and walked no more with him. And he said to them, will you also go away? And this uneducated fisherman, who of course became among the wisest, as all do who embrace the truth of the gospel, he said, Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. You see here what is tied together with the Christ, the Son of the living God? It's his wonderful words of life, the words of eternal life. That's what we need to get to heaven. We need that Christ, the Son of the living God. We need his words of eternal life. Tonight, do we have any in the audience who have turned back to walk no more with the Lord? Will you also go away if you've gone away? Won't you come back? Won't you come back tonight, repent and pray God's forgiveness? If you've turned away from the only way to heaven, Jesus Christ and his words of eternal life, would you repent and pray God's forgiveness? As Peter told Simon, in Acts 8, 22. For my beloved friend tonight, if you have not come to Christ in the words of eternal life, would you not do that this evening? Come to him in faith, Hebrews 11 and 6, in repentance or perish, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. Come believing with all your heart, making the good confession that Peter declared here, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 5, Jesus Christ might bathe you in his blood and cleanse you from your sins, that you might put on Jesus Christ even tonight. If you need to come, would you not, as we stand and we sing? Brother Danny, we deeply appreciate that fine message. There's just no way to overemphasize the importance of the Word of God, rightly divided and studied and meditated upon. And really, as he so well put at the end of his sermon, all of us are expected by various stages of life, capacities and abilities to be Bible people. And that's what's going to make the difference in us being faithful and not being faithful. And we are deeply appreciative of your examination of that book, setting out its errors and setting forth the truth of God. Uh, let me mention that uh, in the morning, Brother Don Tarbit will be speaking to us at 9 o'clock. Of course, you want to be here at 8 o'clock for biscuits and gravy. 
I think, isn't there a passage in the Bible, that I think I quoted it this morning, folks back here, that take a little biscuits and gravy for thy stomach's sake, not off infirmity? <laughs> I think that's, that's a perversion, I believe. Okay, but you're welcome to come, and we appreciate that breakfast being offered. Brother Johnny X and Nine will be speaking at 10 o'clock on renewal for mission, which is a work by several different people, one of them the Christian church. Then again at 10, the ladies' class, and Sister Linda Pogue, and 11 o'clock, Michael Hatcher, dealing with uh, Shelley and Harris's book, The Second Incarnation. So I hope you'll make your plans to be here, and we certainly appreciate all those that have come our way. And remember the book is to be bought, distributed, and above all, read. And uh, CDs can be picked up. If you have any questions you want answered in an open form the next two days, there's paper to write those down, place to sign up for the CDs and so forth here. So we hope that you'll do that. Brother Buddy, you think of anything else? Is one of the other elders, wherever you are? Okay. I guess after this afternoon, I ought to ask the elders' wives have anything they need to say. <laughs> now you'll have, that's a joke, folks. That's a joke. We are allowed to joke, aren't we? Okay. I don't know of anything else, so we'll be uh, led. Brother John will lead us in a closing song, and then we'll be dismissed. Brother Jeff Blitke will be leading us in a closing prayer. Would you stand, please? <laughs>